Hey there, Mr. Reddit here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Our first story we'll be reading today. My girlfriend is demanding an expensive engagement ring that I don't want to pay for. After that, robber mistakes me, the cashier, as a customer, offers to cut me in on the robbery. And after that, fill out a health and wellness survey of every shift after losing most our benefits? Sure, boss. Now for every thumbs up this video gets, one Karen does not get an expensive engagement ring. Anything's better than this crackerjack ring you gave me. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. My girlfriend is demanding an expensive engagement ring that I don't want to pay for. I, 26 male, have been with my girlfriend, 26 female, for four years and we've recently been talking more and more about marriage. Although my girlfriend grew up relatively well off, for the time I've known her, she's been pretty low maintenance. She's never cared about designer brands, rarely buys new clothes, and the jewelry she owns was gifted to her. I have a decent job now, 80k a year, and I've been saving for a while, but growing up, my family didn't have a lot of money. My girlfriend and I have always seemed to be on the same page when it comes to saving money. I assumed she would be fine with a more affordable ring. When I started looking into rings, I discovered Mossonite rings, which look similar to diamond rings but are much more affordable. I was looking at rings in the $1,500 to $1,800 range. When I mentioned this to her, she insisted she wanted a real diamond ring and sent me links to a bunch of diamond rings that she liked. The prices ranged from $6,500 to $10,000. I told her that I wasn't willing to spend that much. She seemed genuinely mad and said it wasn't that expensive. We got in a pretty big argument over it. I told her that it was ridiculous to ask me to spend that much and that I thought she was more reasonable than that. She said I was being cheap and that I could afford it and that I was basically saying she wasn't worth it. I told her no one is worth a $10,000 ring. Eventually, my girlfriend said she didn't care and that I should get whatever ring I want but she's clearly still mad and I know this is going to be an ongoing argument. I'm a bit frustrated because this seems out of left field. I've always known marriage is super important to her, but I didn't realize she'd insist on a diamond ring. So I talked to her older sister about it, who despite agreeing diamond rings were stupidly priced, sided with my girlfriend and said if I could afford it, she didn't see the big deal. She added that my girlfriend has done so much for me and I was being a jerk about this. What my sister means by girlfriend doing so much for me is that she was really supportive when I was in a serious accident four years ago. I broke multiple bones and required a few surgeries. Although where I live, most healthcare is covered, I was unable to work for a while and had expenses I wasn't able to pay. I'd been dating my girlfriend for only six months at the time and she was really there for me. I couldn't pay my rent, so she let me move in with her for free and helped pay for a few expenses and for physical therapy I needed. She also helped me get a job with her uncle who was the VP of an insurance company. It was an entry level position and I had a business degree so it's not like I was unqualified. Obviously, I thanked her for all she did for me, but it's not something we talk about much. I don't think I'm obligated to buy an expensive ring because she helped me out a few years ago. But if my own sister said this, I'm guessing my girlfriend must feel this way as well. Am I the jerk here? Edit. This post got way more attention than I expected. I've definitely reconsidered my stance. I'm going to talk to her more about this. Thanks for all your help. Well, who do you agree with? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. There's no better way to show someone you love them than by giving $10,000 to the billionaires who run the blood diamond industry. Robber mistakes me, the cashier, as a customer, offers to cut me in on robbery. I'm a convenience store cashier, and besides the occasional robbery, nothing really happens here. We've had a handful of super dramatic, get on the ground robberies, but most are just regular shoplifters. Because nothing really happens here, I like to make small talk with the people in the store to pass the time. Sometimes people have great stories. Sometimes we end up knowing someone in common. Sometimes it's just nice to make a person smile. The other day I was out from behind the register stocking shelves. I was the only person in the store because weekday afternoons are usually slow and because basically everyone's quit. It's getting cold here and the building still hasn't turned the heat on. So I had a hoodie over my uniform, short sleeve shirt and name tag so I guess I just looked like a guy browsing the aisles. But it wasn't a problem because when a customer came in, I'd say, let me know if you need anything, and that cleared it up. 
Maybe two came in the entire start of my shift. Just as things were wrapping up and I've had a long dead streak, a guy about my age came in and seemed in a great mood. He also had a big hoodie, but it's cold out, so I didn't think anything of it at all. I said, let me know if you need anything, from down where I was with the shelves. And he came and stood by me, kind of giggling. Weird, but I've seen weirder. Whatever. Finally, I said, can I help you? And he just goes, hey. So I'm like, hi. And he starts talking to me about the logo on my hoodie, local sports team. And we go back and forth a bit. My side of the conversation was normal. His side was really overstated. In hindsight, it's because he was nervous. But I was kind of checked out and didn't really care at the time. Like, I'd say, he's got a good arm, but his head just isn't in it this season. And the guy would reply, Oh my god, the best arm. Once in a lifetime talent. But he's not there at all. Gone. Trash. Garbage. They should just cut him. I keep stalking the shelves, not thinking at all about the odd nature of what he's saying and instead thinking in the back of my mind, is he going to buy something or what? From there, we actually got to talking about how we got into the game and had a really heartfelt conversation about going with our fathers and sitting in the cheap seats and did actually sort of bond a little. Finally, we run out of sports commentary to make it one another though, so there was a wave of a silence for a few minutes. Then he gets uncomfortably close to me and whispers, I like you a lot, you know that? So my first thought was that this guy was hitting on me. No problem at all if that's what you're into. It's not my scene though, so I took a healthy step back and told him thanks, but no thanks. He laughed kind of maniacally and explained to me, no, he meant he liked me, so he'd be willing to cut me in on what he was currently doing. I ask what that is. He explains, ain't nobody in here. I've got my truck outside. I'm gonna load it up with beer and crap. You seem like a good dude. So I'm tipping you off in case you want anything. Ain't no one here. It's easy money, bro. I couldn't believe it. He was trying to rob the store, and he was telling me about it. I quickly realized his overly excited, socially inappropriate behavior must have been something he was on. Rather than confront someone that's on something, in my experience, their moods can change from perky to violent really quickly. I just went with my gut and decided to play along. I knew I needed an excuse to get back behind the register, so I said, good crap, forget the beer though, man, I'm going for the real easy money. And I hopped over behind the counter, where I promptly, but discreetly, pressed the button that locks the doors from the inside, followed shortly by our brand new panic button. First time I'd ever used it. Hoping there wouldn't be a time, but at least I wasn't genuinely panicking yet. At this point, he's loaded both shoulders up with six packs and headed for the door to make the first of what I'm sure he anticipated would be several trips. He pushed against the door with his hip, and of course, it didn't budge. And he pushed pretty hard, anticipating it would swing easily, so I kind of felt bad seeing him wins. He nearly dropped the beer. He turned to me, more frustrated than scared at this point, and went, Bruh, the door is jammed. Can you give it a try? I was nervous to step out from behind the register in case this guy had a weapon, so tried to deflect and was just like, Maybe you've got to pull it. He started freaking out and was running around the store. He was trying the back door, but it locked as well. He was trying to climb up and reach the one tiny window we've got, but not only was it too high, it doesn't really fit a person. I kept playing dumb. Eventually the cops came, took a while, and the guy had resorted to hiding in the stock room by the time they made it over. Not before first wrecking a couple aisles in his frenzy, but at least I was able to lock him in the stock room once he went inside. They came in to arrest the guy, and he starts trying to blame the whole thing on me saying I set him up, saying I made him do it. It genuinely confused the police for a bit. So, I don't work here as a robber. I do work at the gas station. Though, how much longer will depend on how many robberies I live down. Fill out a health and wellness survey of every shift after losing most of our benefits? Sure, boss. After reading a story about the boss that calls the worker off the clock to berate them made me think of my petty little story with my company. Like many other companies, our leadership recently released news of upcoming changes that even though profits for our company are up, they are eliminating most of the remaining perks that are still standing. Company supplied phones for anyone except the tops of the departments, gone. Reimbursements for things like safety shoes, eyeglasses for those of us in the metals and fabrication area, gone. All 401k matches, 
merit increases, and or bonuses frozen until figures reflect pre-lockdown levels, i.e. much larger profit margins even though workload has increased. Our direct area has had a few manpower losses due to a few folks deciding to retire and a few that decided to pursue work from home opportunities, hiring freeze to replace anyone. All of this while the majority of the higher ups and anyone who works with a computer and argued they can work from home are, you know, working from home, which in our eyes is essentially a substantial raise or savings for those lucky individuals that can work from home, fuel, daycare, etc. With the cases on the rise again, they decided to implement a health and wellness screening that must be completed every shift within 24 hours to the start of that shift and presented at the security checkpoint. There is even a nice link to where you can complete it on your own phone via an app for our convenience. Already annoyed at the above mentioned cuts, and now they are wanting me to use my personal phone and data to complete a survey before working hours. I read the requirements again. It just has to be within 24 hours to the start of the shift and presented at the security checkpoint. We were working on average between 12 and 14 hour days, so I was easily able to complete and print a physical copy of the survey at the end of the day for the following day's requirement. The next day I showed up to security and gave them the paper. She just kind of looked at it and asked what it was. Told her it was the wellness screening so I can enter the building for my shift. She replied, Oh, well, it has to be done before your shift. This has yesterday's date on it. I pointed at the disclaimer that said it just had to be within 24 hours to the start of the shift, which it was. Which, to her defense, is kind of silly, because a lot can happen between your day prior and the start of the new shift. Looking slightly annoyed, she said, Oh, okay, you can just use your phone going forward so you don't have to print it out. Thanked her and said it was actually easier for me to just do it at the end of my shift so I didn't have to think about it in the morning, especially since I didn't have access to Wi-Fi until I was already past the security checkpoint. Third morning, I did the same thing. She rolled her eyes and put the paper to the side. Didn't realize it at the time, but I was informed afterwards if we didn't use the app version, it didn't have a digital record, so they had to save all physical papers in a folder and retain them in their office. The fourth morning, the head of security was at the door, and as soon as I showed the paper, he asked why I was choosing to do the physical paper instead of the app. Didn't want to get too in-depth, but told him it was easier for me to print it out at the end of the prior workday and these guys do not pay my phone bill, so I was not going to use my personal phone and data to do a redundant survey off the clock every morning. He tried to argue the paper option was really only for the plants and not for the offices, and I was the only person printing them out in lieu of using the app. Told him I did not see where it said plant use only on the form, and if that was the case, HR would need to update the verbiage. A couple of coworkers in the area caught part of the interaction and how the guy was complaining to my boss as soon as he hit the door about 10 minutes later. I filled them in on what I was doing and they decided to follow suit. All 15 of us completed the survey at the end of the day to bring in the following morning. Friday morning arrives. I'm sitting in my car watching as a line forms and everyone has a paper in their hand. Can make out security guard's face. She looks ticked off. Finally get out and go to walk in. Big grin on my face and say good morning. She doesn't say a word, just does the temperature check and snatches the paper out of my hand. Around first break, I see our HR rep walk into the shop and talk to my boss. He looks over at me and points in my direction. Oh boy. And she walks over and introduces herself. We'll call her HRQB because she looks like she can play for a minor league. HR. Good morning, I'm HRQB with Human Resources. We received a call from the head of security and they're saying that you're giving them printouts of the new health surveys. Do you need help with setting up the app? Petty me. Oh no, that's not necessary. I actually already told him it's easier for me to do it at the end of my shift the day prior instead of doing it on my personal phone in the morning. I don't get very good reception here until I'm on the Wi-Fi, and that's past security. HR. Well, you don't need to be on the Wi-Fi here to complete the survey on the app. You can even do it at home before leaving for work and take a screenshot of the confirmation. That way, you won't have to waste paper and the security team member at the door won't have to keep it in a folder and drop it off at the office every day. It will save a lot of time and energy. Petty me. Ah, well, unfortunately, the company has taken away all of the company-issued phones except for select individuals, and I'm not going to do the survey on my personal phone or during non-work hours. 
I agree, doing this survey every single day is a bit redundant and wasteful, but it isn't my paper, and proof is required for me to enter the building. While it is tedious, I'm pretty sure that security is on their phone for 7 out of 8 hours that they are stationed at the door. Think they can take 2 minutes to walk down the hall to drop off the papers at the office. Pretty sure I could have poked the vein on the side of her head and caused a stroke. I thanked her for her time, and my team lead came to pull me to help him with a job slash save me. The first few days of the following week, most of my coworkers kept printing out the physical copies, which I thought was hilarious, but it was pretty short-lived. HR must have worked harder than she had ever worked in her life, because wouldn't you know it, come that following week, an email came out with a link to a new survey that only had to be completed one time online. And if after that at any point you had flu-like symptoms or were around anyone that was sick, they held you to the honor system to report it to supervision slash HR. Can't you just take this subway to your destination? So to set the stage, I live in Istanbul, and us Turks are known for our bad city planning, but Istanbul is extra infamous for it. It's regular for us natives of the city to endure complaints about how bad the traffic is, how awfully structured the roads are, and how long it takes to get to literally anywhere, yada yada, from our friends who come from other parts of Anatolia to work or study here. I just want to get the point across for foreigners about how bad Istanbul traffic and road structure is. If you have a car, it is legit normal to have a two-hour commute home at the very least during rush hour. Anyways, so at my work, they provide a service bus because our building is in the outskirts of Istanbul where they haven't connected a lot of public transportation yet. This is also a common occurrence for us corporate slave folks of Istanbul. Big companies like these are usually located away from the central parts of the city, and people who live close by take the same service bus, and the bus is pretty crowded. About 20 people who all live close by towns to each other. Like I said, I want you to understand how bad the city planning is. To get to these central parts of the city from our building and the outskirts would take no longer than 30 minutes, but traveling between the towns and dropping everyone off is the rest of the one and a half hours. So a Karen joined our bus the other day, and she lived in Taksim apparently, which is a very famous town and is literally connected to every bus, minibus, subway, etc. imaginable. Even you foreigners might have heard of it. She's the only one out of 20 people who lives there. So the bus driver asks her if he can drop her off at a public transportation station that connects to Taksim, which would literally be any station in the entire city. But she refuses and also complains about the bus driver all the way to the higher-ups of the company. And the bus driver gets scolded and disciplined, and was told to drop her off at the exact location she wanted to be dropped off at. Cue malicious compliance. Next day, the bus driver replans the route, keeping Taksim in mind. She's right about in the middle of the drop-off order. And I kid you not, it legit takes just an extra two hours in traffic just to reach to Taksim. That is without including dropping off other people, or reaching the city center, mind you. And of course, once you set the route as it is, since it's impossible to get out of traffic, she can't tell the bus driver she changed her mind and to go somewhere else. She can't get off the bus too. She has to wait with everyone else, or she might be in trouble at work the next day if she hops off at this point. Tired workers are even more tired now, and also upset because they didn't want to suffer in Istanbul traffic any more than they already had to. Bus driver insists on dropping her right in front of her doorstep. She finally gets off the bus and everyone is giving her the stink eye. Because while she did get off, the rest are going to have to wait in more traffic to get out of Taksim now. All in all, she wasted at least 3 hours out of everyone's time, including hers. Probably more out of people who are going to be dropped off after her. She now asks to be dropped off at a minibus station at somebody else's drop off stop. Never complained about it ever again. Am I the jerk for RSVPing no in person to my friend's wedding? Brett is a casual friend of mine. We became friends through other mutual friends and will occasionally grab a beer during lunch, but won't really hang out together unless it's an involved bigger group activity, like bowling. He's a nice guy, likes good music, and the Yankees, but isn't weird about it since he knows I don't know crap about baseball. Anyway, last year, my significant other and I were invited to his wedding and got a save the date in the mail. Due to lockdown, the wedding was postponed and they had to reschedule for this year. They sent out revised save the dates and the wedding falls on a weekend that my significant other and I are planning to move. We couldn't do it any other weekend and since Brett is only a casual friend, 
I figured he wouldn't be heartbroken if we couldn't make it to his big day, especially considering the circumstances. Moving is very stressful. At some point, they mailed us an RSVP, but the house is in such chaos right now, I'm almost positive I threw it away by accident. I figured it was no big deal. I was meeting Brett for lunch anyway. This was last week, and I just let him know in person that we weren't able to make it, but we'd still get him a gift off his wedding registry. I was aiming for the KitchenAid toaster. Brett and I met for a beer, and it was a good lunch. We chatted about work and video games, etc., and of course, the topic of the wedding came up. He asked me if I got my RSVP, and I told him we received it. I explained the situation and said it was unavoidable, but we were going to be moving that weekend and wouldn't be able to make it. He seemed only mildly disappointed, but totally understood. But then, that's where the problem came up. He asked me to just mail back in the RSVP with no in the box. I asked why, since I was telling him in person. He was insistent that I send him back a physical copy. I asked if I could just text him a reminder so he could write it down. He said he gets a lot of texts per day. I asked, maybe an email reminder. He refused, said he gets a lot of work emails. Me, why do I need to mail back the card? I just told you I'm not coming. Brett, I'll forget. The cards are the only way for me to keep track. Me, well, I may have already thrown it out. Brett, what? Why? Me, I knew we were meeting. And, well, I'm pretty sure it didn't have prepaid postage. Brett, oh, so that's it, huh? Can't spare the extra 47 cents? Me, it's 2021. Who even has stamps? I'd need to find out where a post office is. Then do I walk? Take an Uber? And once I'm there, do I buy a single stamp or a full sheet? Maybe one of those rules. It's all just too much. Brett, maybe it's better that you don't come. Me, I wasn't coming anyway. I offered to write down my RSVP on a napkin for him, but the lunch was pretty much over. I'm still getting him a toaster. Am I the jerk? Edit. Not that it really matters, but Brett is still getting an $80 toaster out of this. Edit 2. Call me a jerk all you want, but maybe take a breath and relax before writing me a surprisingly lengthy DM describing how you're gonna get me over something you read on the internet. Am I the jerk for making my niece follow the same rules as my son in my house? My family, myself, wife, and son are neighbors with my in-laws, sister-in-law, husband, and two daughters. Recently, my wife and her sister have been setting up playdates between our son and their youngest daughter at our place as part of childhood socialization. In addition, they are similar in age, five and six. I was a little apprehensive at first, given that they have vastly different parenting methods, like heavy screen time to coax their kids into eating and letting their domestic helpers clean up extensively after them. We have a helper ourselves, but we instruct her to guide our son into cleaning up his toys and food mess rather than spoon feeding him. Their eldest daughter, who is 12, is a recurring reminder to me not to parent our son that way as I find her to be an extremely spoiled brat. During one of these playdates, I was at home and I saw that after they finished playing with a set of toys, she, my son's cousin, moved on to another set without putting them away. My son was in the process of putting these toys away when she told him to leave it and come over. I stepped in at this point and told both of them they would have to pick up their toys before moving on to another set. She told me that the helper would help them clean up and refused to do so. I said if that was the case, playtime was over. She ignored me and went ahead with the next set of toys, which I then took away from her and got her out of the playroom. I told her that if she wanted to continue playing, she needed to apologize and keep the first set of toys. She kicked up a fuss and started bawling and I sent her back to her place. A few hours later, my sister-in-law came down and demanded to know why I was being so mean to her daughter. I explained my stance and she insisted that I could have just let our helper clean up just this once. Our son is at a very impressionable age, so I absolutely refused to budge on this in our own home. She then said that they could send their helper with their daughter to clean up after her if that was going to be such a problem. And I also found out that for the previous playdates, our helper simply cleaned up after them. I said that I do not want them to send their daughter over again, and she told me that I was sticking my nose in their parenting affairs. I told her that it was none of my business, but once they step foot into my house, it's my rules. My wife is on the fence about this. On one hand, she thinks that we have to stick to our principles, but wonders if it was worth souring a relationship over what seems like a trivial incident. Am I the jerk for putting my foot down?
No, you're a good dad. Don't let any of these entitled fools corrupt you. Am I the jerk for not giving away my cat? I volunteer fostering cats. My cats tend to go to a cat cafe, so I don't typically do meet and greets. But when I do, I'll have people stop by so they can see the cat in its territory and get a good sense for the cat's personality. A mom and her four-year-old daughter stopped by to meet one of the kittens. She applied online and went through the foster organization, so I didn't know her. But my husband was home, so I felt pretty safe. I have four cats of my own, and for this meet and greet, I shut them in my guest room just to make things easier. They're not huge fans of kids anyway. Everything was going great. They met and liked the kitten, and when we were walking back to the entrance, we passed the guest room, and the four-year-old heard my cats meowing. So she sprinted to the door and opened it before I realized what was happening. The cats scattered, except for my gray one. He's an adorable boy, with a half-milk mustache and little mittens. She fell in love immediately and ran to him and started yelling that she wanted this one because it was the same as a stuffed animal she has. The mom asked me how much it was for him, and I politely said he wasn't for adoption. She kept arguing with me, trying to get that cat. But like I said, he's my cat. The four-year-old started shrieking because she couldn't have the cat, and she picked him up. I asked her to put him down, but she's four. She started squeezing him, and he was trying to get away, but so far hadn't used his nails. He's such a good boy. The mom made no moves to intervene, and I tried to take the cat without touching her, but I didn't want to play tug-of-war and him end up getting hurt. So I, as gently as I could, tried to pull her arms apart and the mom came at me, screaming not to do this. The cat got away and the whole way to their car, they kept screaming about how I was a terrible person and I shouldn't have showed them a cat they can't have. The four-year-old was bawling uncontrollably. It was horrible. I felt horrible. The mom threatened to call the cops and my foster organization. My husband was asleep because he works third shift, so he only caught the tail end of it. He obviously doesn't think I was the jerk because giving up our cat was never an option. I called some friends and family, and while everyone is shocked, they said I was definitely the jerk for having to put my hands on them. They said my cat could handle himself, but I was worried about her getting scratched or being bitten, and my cat shouldn't be subjected to being squeezed like it's a stuffed animal. But my sister-in-law and mother-in-law both said I should have just given them the cat if it meant that much to the kid. The cat would be their only cat while he's one of my four, and the cat would be happier with them too, and made me feel terrible for causing all the drama. They said kittens are easier to adopt, so adult cats should be given to whoever wants them. But it's my cat. I want him. They're all well taken care of, and we love them very much. Update. My foster organization will not be adopting out to this family, and will communicate with other cat adoption orgs in the area. I feel bad for limiting families that will adopt cats because of the overpopulation of cats, but I never want to see a cat be mistreated or adopted and then thrown to the side. Adult cats should be just as valued as kittens in my opinion. Am I the jerk for not babysitting for my sister-in-law anymore after she called the police on me? My sister-in-law and I have an agreement. She watches my kids three days a week and I watch hers three days a week. This agreement has stood since March of 2020 without issues. Any changes have been discussed weeks in advance. A couple of weeks ago, we had an argument the next day, I brought my kids to her house, dropped them off, and left. I didn't speak to my sister-in-law because when one of us is in a rush, like I was, it's standard for us to just let the kids out, stay in the car, and drive off when you see the door open. I drove to work, about 40 minutes away. When I got there, I had about 20 missed calls and even more texts, all from my sister-in-law, all saying she didn't want to watch the kids given our argument. Her first text arrived a little before I got to her place, but I didn't see it until I got to work because my phone is always on silent when I drive. I rang her, said I'll arrange to work from home, then come get the kids. She said I have 45 minutes to get back to her place or she would call the police. I told my supervisor the situation and she said I could leave after I did a few things. This delayed me 20 minutes. When I got back to my sister-in-law's, just over an hour later, she said she had already called the police when the 45 minutes ran out. I then had to stick around long enough to tell the officer that I didn't abandon them. There was just a communication issue. Sister-in-law and I had another shouting match later over this. I arranged other childcare for my kids and I've been mostly ignoring her since. However, she reached out and apologized and asked if I'd be willing to go back to the old arrangement. I told her to go buzz off. Having something like this on my record, I would never be able to work in my field again, which she knew. 
and her calling the police was a massive overreaction. So if she needs a babysitter, she can go whistle for all I care. She said that if I checked my phone, talked to her that morning, or came back when I was supposed to, she would not have needed to call the police. And I did this to myself, as she gave me a warning with that first text, and I could have checked my phone or spoken to her directly when I got to her place. All of which she says she would have done if she were in my position, given that we had argued the night before. I told her that if she thinks I'm babysitting for her, she's delusional and she's on her own. Because of my refusal, it's looking like she may have to quit her job because my brother and her would pay more for a babysitter than they would earn from her working. My mother and brother have both called me a jerk because there were no consequences to her calling the police and that while she overreacted, she's apologized, so if I really forgive her, I'll let us move on. This income loss would also mean that she, my brother, and my niece and nephew might need to move somewhere cheaper, that my brother might have to take on extra hours at work, and in an extreme scenario, they may even be completely unable to live independently, meaning they'd have to move in with her parents, who live several hours away. Am I the jerk? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her sister-in-law? Please let us know. The best thing you can do with Karens is cut them out of your life, sister-in-law or not. She made her bed, now she gets to lie in it. Support the channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. And come watch this video next, you're not gonna believe what Garen does in that one.